Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Well, the holidays are now among us, and I think you can all agree it's been a very interesting year. And we're all taking a well-deserved break here at Epicenter over the holidays. The entire team has worked tirelessly to bring you the podcast every single week. And yeah, everyone's taking uh, some well-deserved time off. So, But we still have something special for you, nonetheless. Uh, back in July, I was invited uh, by the Cogax and Fabric Ventures team to moderate a really fascinating discussion with Luis Quende, who's the founder of Aragon, who's been on the podcast before, and Tim Draper, the uh, famous investor and founder of Draper Associates. This discussion was around how we should think of the judicial system in the context of crypto and Web3. Increasingly, life and business are happening in a virtual space, and of course, this has been accelerated by the COVID crisis. Web3 infrastructure can play an important role in providing the foundations for a digital jurisdiction, and we're already seeing the seeds for this vision. You know, in the Web3 world, rules are enforced by a decentralized system of governance, and the most basic example of this is to look at the rights to one's funds. Those are insured by the control of the private key at a most basic level. And if we expand on this idea, DAOs allow for a group of stakeholders to participate in governance of an organization that has no affiliation to a nation state. So how do we treat that in the judicial system? And where does that sit relative to existing national jurisdictions? So this session starts with a brief introduction from Lewis and a longer conversation between the three of us. So I'd like to thank the Fabric Ventures and COGX teams for giving us permission to share these sessions with you. I know that they're big fans of the show over there, and I'd like to invite you to check out what they're doing. COGX is one of my favorite event series. They put on really fascinating events, and actually we'll be releasing another uh, panel next week from one of their event series from this year. So thanks to them. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy this conversation between Luis Quende, Tim Draper, and I. And before we go to that conversation, I'd like to wish everybody happy holidays and a very happy and prosperous new year, 2021. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a digital jurisdiction for digital organizations, which is what we are building at Aragon. So... To get started, a digital jurisdiction sounds kind of like very science fiction. So let's like break down what these digital organizations are in the first place and why they need a digital jurisdiction. So we've seen this movement of DAOs, uh, these new kinds of human organization that have popped up in the, in the latest years enabled by blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. And so the idea behind DAOs is that you can create these entities that are decentralized, that have no central leadership that are autonomous in a way that they can incentivize um, people to work for them to actually achieve their goal. And that are also organizations, like they have their own rules and kind of like own boundaries. I think the most basic form of DAO we can think about may be Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is decentralized. There's no central leader. Satoshi, like, you know, it's not the CEO. It is autonomous because it has an incentive mechanism that enables uh, like miners to come into the network and give their computing power to actually make Bitcoin happen, make this idea of a censorship resistant store of value happen. And at the same time, it is kind of an organization because it has uh, its own rules about how the software works. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that model and apply it in a way that it can be generalized so you can create your decentralized organization very easily. And so right now there are um, around 1,400 decentralized autonomous organizations out there. Some of them are not fully decentralized. Some of them are not autonomous. They saw like very early experiments, but you can read more about them in powerby.aragon.org or apr.onehive.org and see what they are up to. So the way I see it is that Web 1, the first version of the web, 
allowed us to basically share ideas across boundaries, like kind of blocks. And then Web2 enabled us to actually share and discuss those ideas, so like social media. And then now Web3 is all about DAOs. It's all about we can share ideas, we can discuss about them, and then we can take action. Because like these ideas don't deserve to just be in the internet and not be implemented at all. There is a lot of chit chat in social media, and a lot of it doesn't actually result in change. So if you put together all this social capital, all the people that are thinking about stuff and discussing about stuff, and they have attention and interest towards the topic with financial capital, with actual funds that you can have in one of these decentralized organizations, because they can control funds, they can control cryptocurrencies, they are native to cryptocurrencies. And if you can put both together, you can actually uh, enable people to take action in ways we haven't seen before. So it might have be seen in the next decade movements that uh, are totally grassroots and they are able to pull funds, they are able to recruit people towards a common cause and they are able to cause social change without a hierarchy, um, without central leadership and being totally autonomous in nature and therefore very hard to corrupt over time, which I think that's what uh, Web3 is about. And like an exercise that I'm doing these days is I'm, th I'm asking myself, what do people feel like they belong to? That is like a very existential question, but that that is for me a very important thing in, in how I frame my thesis around decentralized autonomous organizations. More and more, the answer is on nation states. And that's what is surprising to me. And with the recent events that are going on all around the world, I would say this is even accelerated more. So like when you ask a millennial, um, where do you belong? Like, I think right now, some people may say, well, I belong in like the Ethereum community. I belong to this uh, subreddit. I belong to this uh, internet community. And we're going to see that accelerate until the point that nation states will not be the thing that people feel that they belong to the most. I think we're already seeing that, but that's going to accelerate drastically. So if you think about these communities to like kind of uh, personify them a bit like, some of the communities we've seen, because um, we were doing this campaign called Power by Aragon, kind of showcasing some of the creators of these communities. And we're already seeing this. So like, for example, here um, in the right, we have like uh, Esteban from Decentraland. Decentraland is this virtual world. It's like, if you have watched like uh, uh, Ready Player One, this movie about like a, a future in which everyone lives in, in VR, basically in virtual reality they have basically taken that future and put it in the hands of users so that they can create their own virtual reality world. And they have added a decentralized autonomous organization powered by Aragon in order to enable their users to fully govern that world. So this is like science fiction um, squared, but it's like a virtual reality um, world that is powered by a decentralized autonomous organization. And that is that is live today. Like you can, uh, that is out there today. It's kind of mind blowing. And people really belong that they like really feel that they belong to that community, to the decentralized community, for example. And um, like right now, we, we see more than this like fourteen hundred DAOs created. And like one one kind of thought that I wanted to to bring up here is as we are able to collapse the costs of creating and running a firm to instead of creating a company with all the bureaucracy and uh, all of the issues that we have uh, creating entities in the legal world, if we're able to collapse that cost in smart contracts and in blockchains, then you basically get to a point where like Aragon has incorporated more entities than Panama or Paraguay um, in the last few years. And this is not a fair comparison for many reasons. Like one of them is obviously incorporating a company is not the, the same as creating a piece of software. Uh, or creating a new decentralized organization where the cost may be like 10 bucks. And therefore, if it's 10 bucks and not a thousand, more people are going to create it, right? Also, maybe not fair because the economic activity of these companies in like Panama, Paraguay, maybe more than in Aragon. Like Aragon organizations right now hold around $12 million worth of assets. But it just shows the potential. Like it shows the potential that we can create a framework for people to organize that is way more efficient, way more powerful, easier to use, and therefore it may actually outcompete nation states uh, in their framework that they have for people to organize, which are like you know companies, nonprofits, all of that different legal entities that you can create. And we can streamline this um, a lot. But the kind of problem that DAOs have today is that it's like living in an 
a skyscraper. Like it's extremely modern. It is like science fiction, but it is like living in a skyscraper in the middle of a totally dysfunctional city. Like DIOs today have a bunch of possible attacks. Like, for example, there is no minority stakeholder protection. So if you're in a company and you invest in a company, then if you are the minority shareholder, the majority shareholder cannot just kick you out. Like that is illegal. In DIOs today, as they are basically controlled by computer code, there isn't anything that uh, disallows that. So basically, if you're a minority stakeholder, a majority of participants can decide to basically kick you out or just steal all of the organization's money for them. There are other problems, for example, like right now because of Ethereum and how high the the network, um, the gas fees are and how congested the network is, it takes like $5 to vote on a proposal, which is crazy. So there are like a bunch of kind of dysfunctional pieces here because everything is early. The things we're working on to try to um, counterbalance that and make DAOs very kind of like easy to use and straightforward and actually reach the mainstream are two different tools. One of them is Aragon Court, which is this dispute resolution mechanism that basically enables these decentralized autonomous organizations to, apart from having this smart contract, this computer code, which is extremely efficient, but also extremely narrow in what it can do, they can define like English written agreements. So they can say, hey, this is my manifesto, these are my bylaws. Um, and for example, I am not going to allow that majority participants steal money from minority participants. Something so simple as that, that we uh, keep for granted in the legal system in companies when we create a company like in the US or or, uh, or in Europe, doesn't exist today in the AOs. And that is exactly what Aragon Court enables them to have. Stuff like uh, this kind of like subtle rules that you cannot encode in computer code. And Aragon Court has the potential to really become like one of the kind of like backbones of the uh, new legal system that is being created right now on blockchains. And then there is Aragon Chain. And Aragon Chain basically is this blockchain where uh, DAOs can run very efficiently because it is targeted towards them. So like, if you think about um, Ethereum today, as I was saying, it is great, it's extremely secure, but then it is very expensive for certain interactions. So I think some DAOs will choose to stay on Ethereum, but some others that may not need that high of a security uh, that Ethereum offers um, or that kind of like hyper connectivity may want to switch to Aragon Chain. So the way I'll compare it is that you have like Manhattan, which is like kind of Ethereum. It is very expensive um, and you can get a studio there, but like it is expensive and you get probably like a small studio or you can move to the servers. You can move to get a house with a pool and a garden, but then you will have to commute if you want to interact with many of the like Ethereum native protocols, right? So there are like kind of trade-offs, but we still believe that Coupling these things together, uh, we basically make uh, DAOs viable. So going back to Aragon Court, because this is like extremely exciting. If you take a look at how we are engineering the product so that DAOs can use these subjective agreements, this is a this is how it will look like. So basically, like this is an Aragon organization. This is the front end for it. You have um, different apps on the left, like botting, tokens, the finance, kind of the, the file management for the DAO. And then in the middle, you're able to create an agreement. <clears throat> and so that agreement is basically like a bunch of like English written text um, that then you can reference. And when you create a vote, when you create a proposal on the organization, um, the proposal has to adhere to that agreement. And if it doesn't, then any member of that organization can open a dispute. So for example, if I'm trying to pass a proposal to withdraw all of the organization's money and send it to a terrorist organization, then someone can say, hey, no, I want to dispute that action. And so you open a dispute, you say, hey, this is not in compliance with the manifesto or with the bylaws that we all agreed upon. I want to dispute it. And then it goes to the Aragon court. And this is how Aragon court looks like. Um, it's been running for a few months in kind of like a test environment. So like there is um, a few real disputes that it has um, already arbitrated, but it's mostly kind of like internal um, disputes because we're still like testing it out. But it's been working incredibly well. And we have more than 300 euros that are anonymous people on the internet that thanks to crypto economic incentives are able to make decisions on real things. So for example, here there's a dispute to add an app to um, a rewards like uh, program. So basically like developers build apps and then they can claim rewards. And the idea here is that uh, to choose whether that app was eligible or not 
to for those rewards. And so the apps have to have certain requirements. For example, they have to be open source. They have to have documentation. These things you cannot check with computer code, right? They need humans. They need users. And so users have been curating that list. And it is a very early use case, but I'm so excited about it. So the idea here is basically like as Nick Sabo, one of the kind of like uh, inventor of like Benny Smart Contract uh, like names and, and kind of nomenclature, he puts it as dry code. This is like computer code, wet code that is human language. And then uh, the way I'm looking at it is that both dry code and wet code are incredibly important to arrive to truly decentralized autonomous organizations. And finally, um, ANT, as we look at it, is like basically the uh, network's store of value. So like it is the, um, the token that gets you all together and is able to um, like incentivize the participants in the network to do their job. The master plan that we have for the Argon network is basically these four lines here. So I love how like Elon Musk put together a master plan for Tesla um, because I love simplicity. I love like getting just very complex things and having them very simple. So the idea is we are building software for decentralized autonomous organizations to exist. And then we're going to use that software to let a bunch of them exist in the first place. And then with that market share, we're able to provide services to them that actually make them way better, that make these decentralized autonomous organizations way better. And so with those uh, profits that the network, that the community makes, we can actually increase the AO adoption. And eventually what we can do is we can build this new way of people to organize that goes way beyond nation states um, and is basically a digital jurisdiction. So that's what we are building, a digital jurisdiction for digital organizations. I think this is a lot of things to swallow. So I, I'm looking forward to like the panel and like kind of um, putting it in a more comprehensible way. But basically I think the, the TLDR, the, the summary, is that DAOs are a very new, exciting way of organizing via communities and grassroots organization and using blockchain technologies, we can actually make them happen. And I think right now they are really needed in the world because of everything that's going on. And DAOs enable society to actually tackle problems that we couldn't tackle via any nation state uh, or because most of them are just kind of really crooked or via um, any, any centralized company. And DAOs are a huge new opportunity that we have to reinvent the kind of socialist um, fabric of our society and how we organize. So I'm extremely excited about them and extremely excited about how we can create a digital jurisdiction for digital organizations. Amazing. Thank you so much. I am so excited um, to see a new Aragon jurisdiction at some point soon and perhaps even citizenship and passports and all of that. Um, so hopefully that's coming. And now we have a panel discussion on the same topic where Luis will be joined by Tim Draper, a venture capitalist and the founder of Draper Associates, and Sebastian Couture, um, co-founder and host of Epicenter Co Podcast. Thank you, Anastasia. Hi, my name is Sebastian Couture. I am the host of Epicenter. We're one of the leading crypto podcasts and we've been around for over six and a half years. I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists today for a conversation about rethinking the judicial system a digital jurisdiction for decentralized organizations. Um, so our first panelist, Tim Draper, is a venture capitalist and the founder of Draper Associates and Draper University. He is a pioneering investor who's been involved in just about every successful internet company since the internet came about. I'm not going to start listing them. And he's also a Bitcoiner, as his tie indicates. Uh, I don't know if you want to show your tie there, Tim. Luis Quende project lead at Aragon. It's a platform that allows people to create and govern DAOs. And recently they launched Aragon Court, uh, which arbitrates on subjective disputes and uh, that require you know, human judgment. And on his days off and also at his Ethereum conferences, he is a DJ. So thank you for joining me today, gentlemen, and uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Terrific. Yeah, thanks for having us, Sebastian and COGX. We're, I'm thrilled to be uh, talking to the audience. So, Lewis, during your talk, you mentioned that increasingly young people, I think you, you perhaps said millennials, feel less and less connected to the place they're born. And, you know, as a millennial, uh, you know, living abroad and you know, have, not having lived in the country where I was born for the last 15 years, I, I do kind of, you know, feel, feel that and I sort of associate with that trend. Why do you think this trend exists and why is it accelerating? Well, I think national states are like this huge 
places where like you have millions and millions of people and it's just very hard for the human brain to empathize with people you like don't know at all right and so like nation states back in the day uh maybe they were smaller maybe they were less people on the planet um i don't know exactly what like kind of moved the needle maybe it is the internet right like right now i can feel more attached to someone i don't know that lives in like australia and like literally other part of the world that i haven't met physically than someone that lives next to my place and so I think that trend is just accelerating more in nascent states, how I'm able to adapt to it. Tim, I don't know if you have anything to add on this. Yeah, I have a, I have a um, picture, and this is where uh, Luis and I sort of dovetail. Um, the internet opened up the world. The, um, the geographic borders fell up uh, benefiting in a great way. We all uh, became wealthier, uh, quality of life improved. The things went incredibly well for many, many years, and then, and then the the uh, then Bitcoin came along, and there was a decentralized currency, and uh, the nation states, the the uh, governments were were um, allowed the network to kind of flow, but when when they they realized that there was a better currency out there than what they were providing to their to their citizens. Uh, many of them were threatened and they wanted to pull back and go from that global society that we had back to tribalism. And they created these walls and barriers and trade barriers and whatever at the sacrifice of their own people. Uh, one way to look at this is, let's say there are only two people on the earth and I have a house and you have a farm. Well, um, if we don't trade, I die of starvation and you die of exposure. So if um, and, and so we need to trade around the world and, and multiply that by eight billion people. All those people can provide different things to each other and we all benefit in an in a enormous way. And if you're a, you're a government that isolates and creates this um, isolation, you are hurting your own people. Uh, if you're a government that's free and open, you are helping your people become wealthier and, and healthier. So I'm looking and I'm saying, oh, wow, this decentralized world that started with Bitcoin and moved to the blockchain smart contracts um, and now actually governing can be done sort of in an artificial intelligence way. It's going to change the nature of what a government is and governments like businesses are going to have to compete for their constituents. They're going to have to provide better services for the taxes they provide because the genie's out of the bottle. We're global. All of us, citizens of the world, we're global. We're in a really interesting time here where it's the, it's the roar of the dying lion. It's the roar of the, the death of tribalism. And they're saying, no, stay in place. No, wear a mask. Be be our people, you know, be trapped in our little location. Stop travel. Um, and, and maybe it was COVID that did this, but maybe, you know, some countries are sort of taking advantage of this by trapping their citizens in place. And all of a sudden, this globalism that we had that was booming and, and really building an extraordinary economy around the world is now um, being isolated and trapped. And I think that's a temporary ph phenomena. And when the roaring lion dies, uh, there is going to be this new world. And the new world is going to be peaceful, loving, open. And we are all going to be able to benefit from each other. And so I got very excited when Luis uh, brought up uh, Aragon because he showed us the way to a new form of governance that is, uh, that is much more... Um, open and transparent and cross border than any government that we've ever seen. And it, and he's hitting the judicial piece of it, you know, where uh, another company on unstoppable domains is making it. So we get free speech for the entire world. We uh, other Bitcoin is making it so that we have a currency that we can use anywhere in the world without any friction across borders. Uh, or or any friction within the bank. The bank takes two and a half to four percent every time you swipe your credit card. But with Bitcoin, it's actually uh, free and open and transparent. Uh, 
we have the beginnings of this new, open, transparent, and very frictionless world that can create the kind of liquidity that we only dreamed of. And that that open world is going to have governing that is sort of cro- across borders. The Estonian government, they came up with this I- idea of an e-governance. And I'm actually the third virtual resident of Estonia. The prime minister of Estonia came to Draper University and made me a virtual resident, which meant that I could be, in effect, a citizen of Estonia without living in their physical territory. And I could do business anywhere in the EU without living in that physical territory. So I think that kind of thing is going to force other governments to think, whoa, wait, you could actually virtually provide governance to people. It doesn't have to be land based. And most of what governments do is insurance, you know, whether it's healthcare insurance or workman's comp insurance or unemployment insurance, which is a big one now. All those insurance products can be provided virtually and they can be provided across borders. So we're looking at a time when suddenly governance can be provided 11 miles offshore or from up in space, and it can provide us the same kind or actually better services for our taxes than our physical land-based tribal governments are providing today. It's an anthropological advance that humans are about to go through. They've been tribal. The tribalism protected them for many years. And all of a sudden, we have this opportunity. And and, uh, if you can go dystopian, it ends up just being a bunch of nation states. If you go utopian, it opens up the world. If you're an optimist, you realize this opens up the world and everybody benefits. So so we have the opportunity now to take a quantum leap anthropologically uh, as humans. And this is our chance. It's a big opportunity. So I'm supporting everything that goes after that I can see that can actually penetrate this and drive this decentralized world uh, forward. And I think so much of the, you know, the current situation also kind of applies to this here. And I think, you know, COVID perhaps accelerated some trends that were already in play in, 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 in effect. And, and certainly you know, with the, with the events happening in the U S and around the world right now, around, you know, the social and racial inequalities that sort of plague our societies, you know, we're seeing that the moats, right. That governments have tried to put around us. We're seeing them really digging their heels in and making sure that sort of people stay in their place. Um, so I'm also sort of a, you know, a proponent of, of this, this, this more open and decentralized system whereby you know, people are free to choose wherever they want to do business or wherever they want to live or wherever they want to raise families. One of the things here that I think as technologists and as sort of you know, people who you know, live and operate in a sort of privileged space um, is how do we ensure that these decentralized judicial systems, you know, things like Aragon are building, how do we ensure that these systems, as we kind of reboot society, you mentioned this anthropological upgrade, how do we ensure that as society, as a society, we make sure that these new systems are egalitarian, are diverse, and don't create the same types of tribal natures that we've seen you know, throughout history, only now it's in a smart contract. Only now, you know, you can't go and 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 complain, or you can't go and 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 file a complaint, or uh, or, or, or some sort of physical, you know, um, uh, action against someone. How do we make sure that the future, this utopian future, is utopian and it doesn't turn into dystopia? You know, I think that there's a um, there are a couple of people thinking about it in a lot of different ways. Andrew Yang was working on a a universal basic income. I actually think that a universal basic income in crypto might end up being the thing that actually rises. Um, the idea that you do universal basic income in any of these fiat currencies will bankrupt whatever country uh, tries to do it. Uh, but you could provide a base level for the world and then provide a very free market above that. Uh, which is um, 
which would uh, limit the restrictions people put on other people. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, the 40 Act and the 33 Act uh, the, of the SEC, those are 80 years old, but they're basically pe- keeping impoverished people down. They are keeping people from being able to get that first rung of the ladder. They are keeping people from being able to invest in private companies that have high growth rates. They are forcing people. uh, The only people who can invest in venture capital are millionaires. Why did that happen? Where did that come from? They're trying to protect us from ourselves. The more the government protects, the more they keep people down. Uh, We need actually everyone to be able to participate in this new world. And um, and pretty much we all have smartphones. So we're starting from a pretty good base. Now, we don't all have smartphones. I think it's now up to 6 billion of the 8 billion people on the planet. But I think within two years, we're going to have all 8 billion of us will have a smartphone. So that we'll, ha- we'll all have the ability to use this thing to send Bitcoin, to, to use Aragon for our justice to provide our input for a judicial system, to provide our voice to an unstoppable domain where, where they guarantee a, a freedom of speech, where you cannot stop it. They can't stop it. No one can stop it. No one can, can censor it. You know, now you're starting to see censorship on Twitter, censorship on uh, people are saying that the Facebook is is favoring one group or another. You're seeing uh, you're seeing bullying from the major networks where they're saying you have to think this way or else you're a you know you're you're an outcast or whatever. But boy, I don't always think the way the the news thinks. I'm always thinking five or ten years out, maybe twenty years out, and I'm thinking, well, wait a second. If if you shut down the entire economy rather than just isolating the people who have the virus or ha- are at big risk with the virus, you are going to have bigger problems than you would ever have had if you had, um, I mean, you're going to have bigger problems if you shut down the economy than you would ever have if you, um, if you just isolated a few, a few of the people who are at risk. This mass driving force that seems to be the media and it's and it's a, and it has a point of view that you have to comply with that's the most dangerous thing going but the good thing about this decentralized world is that everybody gets a voice so i think we are headed into a utopian frame of mind we're going through some serious speed bumps on our way because the existing powers the the old line media, the governments, the banks, they are all trying to keep it the old way. And, uh, but, and they're trying to keep people down because they are up. I think we, we're about to head into a time where, uh, where it's an equal opportunity for everybody in this new environment. I think Lewis, I'd like to I'd like to uh, bring it over to you briefly and, and ask you if you know, within the work that you're doing at Aragon, if you're also thinking about this and and the you know kinds of frameworks that that yeah. are, are Aragon are being built upon, are, are you you know, consulting with say like historians, anthropologists, you know ethics committees and stuff to to make sure that the systems that you're building don't produce the same sort of inequalities and fractures that we see in our current uh, sort of social system but also judicial systems yeah i mean i'm i'm definitely the the doer type so like uh, i really like to get something working and then people like can try to destroy it um and that's what happens with like smart contracts you release something people try to destroy it but i think like we can make a lot of advancements not even like talking to to those people we can just make advancements by um, having some common sense in the beginning like for example following up to what tim was saying facebook has paid 130 million dollars to create their own moderation court for content, uh, it almost makes me laugh because it's like it is a centralized court or like arbitrator or whatever that they have paid a bunch of money to do. And in the end, what they are doing is uh, basically censoring people. Like that is a deal they are. Um, for much less, we have built a fully decentralized court, permissionless. Um, so far, so it's been working. Uh, and 
And I think that is exactly what we need to do. Like we need to get these things out. We need to start using them. I think the very important thing is that people who create the systems have the right intentions at heart. I think that is super, super important. There's this paradox in kind of decentralized systems where on one hand, you want to make sure that intentions don't matter because that's the whole point, right? Like you want to see that Satoshi goes away and nothing happens, right? Because the like he's not a leader anymore in that space. But at the same time, people who are working on this space right now and creating those tools need to have very strong like intentions and uh, the word intentions at heart. And so I think it is important to do that, to apply a lot of common sense because like, you know, stuff like nation states and like these big companies, web two companies that are censoring the internet have completely <clears throat> eroded our perspective on common sense. So then just doing that is a very good step. And then after you have it out, after you get some users, product market fit, um, then I think it's a good time to start iterating on feedback. And obviously being community run, the community can decide what to do with it. There is no central power that has dictatorship over the protocol. And I think that is the most important thing. Talk about some of the applications that are currently being built on Aragon and some of the early uh, use cases that you've seen for the Aragon court, which came out just recently. Yeah, I mean, Aragon court is like very uh, kind of early and doing like baby steps. Like, you know, it's curating this cute list of like developers that are going to get a reward in this kind of like rewards program. Uh, it is probably going to be able to moderate messages. So that is like extremely baby steps. But I'm super excited about it. Like, I think it will be open for anyone to open disputes like in the next couple of months. Um, and then the idea is that like, or my dream at least that like 10 years from now, like I see no reason why the entire like legal system, maybe not the entire, because like this is the thing with decentralized court systems, right? Like they are fully limited liability. Like you cannot put, put people into jail. That is the good thing and the bad thing as well. Because like if you have a terrorist or like a rapist, you want to put them in jail, right? Uh, you don't want them to just lose some cryptocurrency on the internet. But on the other hand, that is the amazing thing about decentralized justice systems. Like, there is no violence. It's just poor crypto economics. And that's also what I love about it. Yeah, that's also perhaps one of the limits of, of this system, unless at some point we start having, you know, private police also, uh, you know, uh, sort of embedded within arbitration agreements and things like that. I, mean, I don't know if that's a future towards which we want to go, but you know, we can kind of like, perhaps extrapolate here a little bit more and, and talk about where, you know, where Aragon Court or, or even even a DAO, you know, built on, on Aragon, where, where does it sit within the existing, you know, legal and, and, and judicial framework? Is it extrajudicial or is it some, some sort of a subset yeah. or trying to replace it? Maybe, Tim, you want to you know, address this? I think Luis can do a better job of that. I think like the... <laughs> Everything that we're building right now, like the paradox is it is going to, at some point, replace the existing systems because it's just like way better. But at the same time, it needs to live with the systems until we get there. So like one example of that, um, I was trying like different on-ramp solutions for crypto because like I am very frustrated with the fact that today, if you want to use a crypto product, you have to go through like many hoops to actually do it. So like you cannot use enter your credit card and that's it, right? You have to like buy tokens, KYC with an exchange, all of that. But that is needed right now because there is just no other way. Like, how do you translate your dollars to like, you know, crypto or Bitcoin? And so I think we will have like a few years in which we will have to deal with these things uh, very carefully and also invest into like, just kind of like compliance with the existing system until we're able to completely overthrow it. But that's what like got me excited, right? Like I didn't get into crypto to like do KYC <laughs> compliance. As we wrap up here, you know, we're we're nearing the end of our panel. Um, you know, Tim, you, you've invested in lots of companies, too many to name here, but several companies in the crypto space. Why why did you buy into the Ant uh, token model, and where do you see the future of this platform going? Well, when I, I first thought, thought about Bitcoin, I thought, oh, well, that's going to be interesting. Virtual currency it will be. It'll be more liquid. It'll move faster. It'll create more liquidity and people will become wealthier. And I thought it was going to be just sort of the games would turn into eventually a currency that we all agreed on. But then Bitcoin came along and it had this decentralized piece. And it also had this blockchain that kept perfect records. And then from there, you could build smart contracts. All of a sudden, um, this changes all of commerce, all of finance, all of banking. And the thing that went off in my mind was, well, first, 
when a bunch of Bitcoin was stolen in Mount Cox, I thought that was the end of Bitcoin, but there was a whole bunch of use of it. And it only dropped about 15% um, in value on that news. And I thought, wow, people really need this. And then I thought, how would I use it? Well, I would love to have Bitcoin that came, uh, raise money in Bitcoin, invest it into entrepreneurs in Bitcoin, have them pay their employees and suppliers in Bitcoin, and then have um, the entire, like if a company goes public or gets the entire waterfall in Bitcoin wallets and automatically done. Uh, it's amazing how accounting bills and legal bills and auditing bills and bookkeeping bills have gone up over time as regulations get heavier and heavier and heavier, at least in the U.S. It's pushing people away from the U.S. And I started to think, wow, this is really necessary for the world economy. We are going to be so much better off if we've got some form of decentralized currency that's global and open and transparent and keeps perfect records and does a the whole ledger and and uh, and then the idea that you could have a smart contract built into uh, software, which you no longer need to have lawyers and uh, all of the all of the battles and all that stuff over because you know that it was built into software and you agreed to it and you both agreed and that was it. That's a world where I'm thinking this is going to be a much more peaceful, loving world, far less complex many fewer battles, many fewer disputes, uh, fewer regulations, which allows freedom. And that freedom allows, uh, encourages entrepreneurship and creativity. Uh, I think that's a world I'm, I want to see. And so I have, uh, I have put a lot of my effort and a lot of my venture money into uh, crypto opportunities, into Bitcoin opportunities, into wallets and exchanges and uh, and then into these new governing businesses uh, like Aragon or Unstoppable or many others who are sort of thinking about how government, what will that look like? Who will, who will be your tribe in this global environment? Will they be cross borders? Will will they be sort of a community of people who kind of think in a certain way? Or will it be just a, a random selection of people that end up uh, feeling like, hey, this is a great way to go? I'm excited about that future. I think we need to drive toward it. I think we've got, we, we really need to, this is one of those things where in the military, they say freedom isn't free. You have to fight for it. This is one of those times you've got to fight for global freedom uh, so that we aren't just kept down by regulation and, and, uh, and too much governance and too many intricate overlapping laws and too, much, uh, too many forms to fill out and too many regulations to overcome in trying to create a better world. We need to fight for this. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>